Good morning, church. Good to see you here this morning. Obviously, some of you are aware, I'm sure, that school is out for summer, and I know that makes many of you in here very happy and excited. We also have, obviously, a Memorial Day weekend, and today is also a fifth Sunday, so you know what that means. We're going to have a potluck here in just a little while, and so we've got a lot of good stuff going on, good time of year. Glad to see you here uh, this morning. So we've been going through this series in the month of May, looking at this Faith Hall of Fame, this chapter that is famously written in Hebrews chapter 11. We're probably familiar with this idea of a Hall of Fame. It's not something that's new to us. There's a lot of different Hall of Fames out there. Uh, if you are a sports fan, you're probably familiar with the NFL Hall of Fame. These guys get a gold jacket. They get a bronze bust made of their face. And they give a speech and all that kind of stuff. And so they are forever enshrined in this uh, prestigious uh, museum and hall. Uh, you know, that's, that's the NFL. I'm more of a basketball person, and so I'm more partial to the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. That's always been a, a very uh, big one for me, being a basketball fan. Of course, there's a lot of them in sports. There's a lot of Hall of Fames in sports, but we see it in other places as well. If you are a music person, there's a lot of different Hall of Fames for every genre of music that you can think of. Probably the most famous one is the, is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This is the one that's in Cleveland. And so there's all kinds of Hall of Fames uh, for lots of different things. We also have some that are more you know, local, more regional level. Uh, if you go down to Waco, we have the Texas Sports Hall of Fame. And right across the street is this one, which is the Texas Rangers Hall of Fame. And so we see these all over the place. And we understand what this means as having a Hall of Fame. And we go through and we see the people that we can look at, the people that we can learn from, the people that have influence on us in these different uh, parts of life. Of course, this month we've been going through Hebrews chapter 11. For us, this is what we would refer to as a faith hall of fame. We have all of these different people known and being mentioned for the fact that they had this wonderful and great faith in God. And so you go through this chapter, we've been going through it this whole month. There's a lot of things mentioned about faith, a lot of people that are mentioned. The word faith itself is used 25 times throughout the chapter. And so, obviously, if you go through it and you read this chapter, you go, hmm, I think this chapter might be about faith. And you're right. Because it's mentioned a lot. We go through and we see faith mentioned. And we see these people mentioned. Over 16 people are mentioned just individually. We have 16 individuals that are mentioned by name. We also have groups of people, four other groups of people that are just kind of mentioned together as groups of people. They're, they're not named specifically, but they are talked about for their faith and recognized for their faith. And so we go through this Hall of Fame and we see here is all the great men and women of the past who are known for this one single trait, which is their faith and their trust in God. Now you get to the end of the chapter, you get to the end of Hebrews chapter 11. This is how this wonderful chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, ends. Verse 39, all these, talking about these men and women we've been studying, all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And so he says they received these things, or they're recognized for their faith, but they didn't receive the final prize because we all as Christians will have this reward together. And so they have not yet fully received what they have lived their whole lives for. That apart from us, they're not going to. That all together, these great men and women of faith, at the same time as all of us, will receive this eternal reward, this eternal inheritance that we know is heaven. Now, I'll point out to you, we've said this several times, but I'll remind you that when this letter is originally written, there are no chapter divisions, there are no verse divisions. We don't have chapters in our Bible until about the early 1200s, and we don't have verses until about 1551, and our first Bible to have both of those, chapters and verses, doesn't come around until 1560. So we're less than 500 years of having a Bible where we have chapter divisions and verse divisions. And I point that out because when this is originally written, the Hebrew writer is going to write about this all these men and women of faith. He says this about them having not yet received the promise. 
And then he goes into this next part, which is our chapter 12. But really, they're connected. And so keep that in mind and go with me and look at Hebrews chapter 12, how this starts. He's, he's continuing this thought process about our faith. Because he uses this word. He hinges everything on this word, therefore. Right? We ask that question. What is the therefore, therefore? And it tells us this is, these things are connected. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people we just read about in chapter 11, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So Paul's switching to a little bit of, or excuse me, the Hebrew writer's switching to a little bit of athletic language, sports language, and he talks about this great cloud of witnesses. Now, what this is not saying, and I think we sometimes get this confused when we talk about this great cloud of witnesses. This is not witnesses in the sense that they are sitting in the stands clapping for us and cheering for us, although I don't think it's wrong to, to get that image in your mind and think about that. What this word witness literally means is he is saying all of these people that I just mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, they are witnesses to the fact that faith in God works. So they're not witnesses in the sense that they're bystanders or they're fans cheering us on as we run the race. We are to remember them because we look back on them as a witness, their lives as a witness, and say, yes, faith in God works, and so I will press on and I will do the same thing. I will live in faith. But then notice what it says in the next couple of verses. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joys before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, I'll come back to the obvious part of this, but we see this played out, what Jesus is going through, what Jesus has done, and the author says, let's focus on him, let's fix our eyes on him, it talks about this joy that is set before him. That's the joy of knowing that Jesus is going to the cross, but he knows that he is going to be raised. This is prophesied in the Psalms. This is the joy set before him. He knows, despite the fact that he's going through this, despite the fact that he's going to the cross, he knows that this is going to accomplish the will of God. And so he has this joy set before him. He's able to take on the cross. It says, scorning and shame. And then after he goes through this sacrifice, he sits at the right hand of God. And so we understand the importance of Jesus' death and His burial and His resurrection. This is what the Hebrew writer says He came to do. And this is the joy that is set before Him. Christ came to earth to accomplish God's will. And so He goes to the cross and ultimately He is raised. And now we have forgiveness of sins. We have the hope of heaven. And the Hebrew writer says, remember Him and consider Him. But it, remember, see what else He also says there in the first part of verse 2 there. He says, Jesus is the author, that means the originator, and the, he's also the perfecter of our faith. And so, that word author, it literally means trailblazer. That this is what Jesus has done. He has come and blazed the trail for us. He has shown us how to live by faith. And we don't often think of, of Jesus as someone who lived by faith necessarily. We say, well, Jesus is God. Did he really live by faith? Yes, he did. He had to trust the Father just as much as we have to trust God. He trusted the Father. He prays. He has an active prayer life. That says a lot about someone's faith. Jesus has to go through all the things that we go through. He had to live a faithful life. And yet, what's the difference between him and all these people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11? He was perfect. He was without sin. He was without Wall. We've been looking at all these people in Hebrews chapter 11. They all have one thing in common. They made mistakes. They fell short. They had problems. They had flaws. Not so with Jesus. The Hebrew writer says he is the author and he's also the perfecter of your faith. Your faith, our faith, begins and ends with Jesus. And so I want us to think about this idea this morning. We can look at these people in Hebrews chapter 11 and we can learn a lot from them. And we can say, yes, they are good examples of faith. But a life of faith is always going to be best modeled after the perfection of faith. Jesus is the only one who lived a perfect life, who lived in faith without flaws, without mistakes. So can we learn from others? Yes. 
but Jesus is always going to be our best example of how to live a life of faith. So I want to give you a couple examples of this in the, in the New Testament, just some ways that this is shown in the New Testament of how we are to do this and how we are to live by faith. I really like the way that Paul puts it uh, in Colossians chapter 2. He will say in verse 6, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. In other words, you accepted Christ in faith, and now continue to live your lives in Christ by faith. This is how we are to live our lives. He uses this phrase, being built up and strengthened in the faith. So we accepted Him in faith, and now we live for Him through faith. Now, sounds really easy. Sounds really simple. Okay, I just live a life of faith. I try to do what Jesus wants me to do. We understand it's not that easy. If it were, there would be a lot more people that would be willing to do it, right? And Jesus tells His apostles early on, don't think this is going to be a cakewalk. Living a life of faith, living a life following in my footsteps, it's not going to be easy. He tells them up front. He lets them count the cost. And he tells them in Matthew 16, Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's going to be a hard path. It's not going to be easy. <coughs> Jesus has promised this. That to follow Christ is going to take sacrifice. And you know this. You, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, living a life of faith is not always easy. There are setbacks. There are struggles. There are times when you, you fail and you fall. And Jesus is letting us know it, it costs a lot to follow me. To live in faith and to pick up your cross and to follow in my footsteps. And yet that is what we are called to. Here's another one in 1 John chapter 2. John simply puts it, Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. That's the goal, right? A living a life of Christian faith that we are to walk in Jesus' footsteps. We follow the path that He has trailblazed for us already. Now, I want to give us a quick, before we uh, look at some application for this week, I just want to go back quickly and look at all the things that we have talked about as far as uh, this series and looking at things this month. And we'll go back and look at the first week. Obviously, we looked at this person. And these are all these people from Hebrews chapter 11. We looked at Sarai the first week. She's somebody who tries to control things. She tries to control events. She tries to manipulate things in her favor instead of trusting God. You'll see this is kind of a very similar phrase, uh, instead of trusting God. So she tries to control events. We talked about the idea that God is always on time. That our faith in God requires us to have a faith in His timing. To trust Him. And I don't know if you associate yourself with this. Maybe as we go through this list you can see some of the things that you struggle with. And maybe you're somebody who is a control freak. Maybe you're somebody who has this issue. And this is what we learned week one with the example of Sarai. Week two we looked at Moses. We looked at him and how he had this, this moment of anger. And it, it costs him very dearly because he's not allowed to enter the promised land. He allows these things, his anger, his temper, to control his actions instead of trusting God and giving glory to God. And so we said we don't need to let the emotional control the spiritual. Make sure that we are not in our anger that it's not causing us to sin and not be faithful to God. Week three, we talked about Jacob, his example. And Jacob is known as somebody who is... He lies, he deceives, he's very crafty, and he's deceiving people. And he does all these things instead of trusting God. He looked at the fact that God gave the promise early on and said, Jacob, I'm going to bless you. The older is going to serve the younger. Jacob didn't have to do all this, and he does. He lies, he deceives. We talked about the idea that there is no uh, scheming in faith. If you're living a life of faith, then you cannot be someone who schemes and lies. That you need to be authentic. You need to be real. That real faith requires the real faith. And the last week, we looked at the example of David. And his main problem, we can look at sexual sin. Uh, we can look at the adultery. We can even look at the murder. But all of those things stem from the fact that he gets caught up in 
coveting. And so he covets instead of trusting God. We talk about this idea that when you want more of the world, then that effectively makes you have less of God in your life. And so we have to choose what we are going to see. And then, of course, this morning, we look at all these things, and we take stock of all these people that we've looked at, and the one thing they had in common, again, is they had flaws. They had mistakes. And yet Jesus is perfect. And so if we're going to live a life of faith, can you learn from those people? Yes, and we should. That's why the Hebrew writer writes that list. It's for us to take a stock of what they have done in the lives that they have lived. But Jesus is going to be our ultimate example on how to live a life of faith. So some quick application uh, this morning. I know that I'm usually the person that stands between you and lunch, but it's also a little bit more, I guess, the risks are a little bit higher now. Uh, the odds are a little bit higher now. It's a fifth Sunday, so it's a little bit different. So I'll give you some application quickly this morning. Uh, the first thing being uh, that we just need to be encouraged and to learn from all these people that have gone before us. So we can look at this list, we can read Hebrews chapter 11, and we can be impressed by the things that, that were accomplished in faith and through faith. And we can learn from them. And we should be able to learn from them and be encouraged by people who have uh, had great faith. We also, again, while that's good, our, our best example, just like it's faith or any other characteristic we want to look at, our ultimate example is always going to be Jesus. And so we need to look to Him. How did Jesus live a life of faith? How was He faithful to the Father? How did He react in certain situations? How did he avoid temptation? What are the things that he did to live a faithful life? We can look to Jesus and see that his example. And then, of course, we also need to turn this outwardly and say, well, what can we do as people who are living by faith? We need to encourage other people to live a life of faith. It's not enough for us just to be faithful ourselves. We ultimately want that to spread. You maybe heard that phrase, don't just keep the faith, share it. Uh, that's the idea. We want to make sure that we are sharing our faith with other people. So this could be an evangelistic sense. It could also be the sense of we are just uh, influencing other people in a positive way. And so we share our faith and encourage one another with the faith that we have. You may remember, this has been several years ago. I think it was 1993, 1994. There was a Nike commercial that involved uh, basketball player Charles Barkley. And in this commercial, he's, he's grabbing rebounds. And he's dunking the basketball, and it's a, a black and white uh, commercial that they shot it, shot it in black and white. And then at the end of the commercial, after he does all these things, he's playing basketball for a little while, they zoom in on Charles Barkley. And you may remember he has this famous quote in this commercial. He says, I am not a role model. And I don't think anybody would argue uh, with him on that. Um, but... The thing that he was missing, and he, he went on to say, people asked him about this, there's a lot of controversy uh, over this back when this commercial came out. And uh, people asked him, you know, what does that mean? What do you mean you're not a role model? Or you don't want to be a role model? And he said, well, just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your children. Okay, that makes sense. I can understand that. But what he failed to recognize is that we don't choose who we have influence on. And so you can say, well, I'm not a role model because I'm just, I just play basketball, right? That's what Charles Barkley was saying. But if people look up to you and they learn from you and they follow your example, then guess what? You are a role model. And so just because we can say we're not doesn't mean that we're not, we aren't, in fact. And so we need to look at this and realize you may not think of yourself as somebody that people look up to, but I will tell you, there are people in your life that are watching you. That you have influence on more people than you let on. That's so close. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your kids. Or maybe it's your grandkids. There might be certain people in your family that look up to you in a certain way. Maybe it's coworkers. Maybe you're a part of a group or a club around town and you have influence in that way. We need to understand that people are watching us. And then we don't choose who we have influence over. And some people are watching, and they're going to see how we are living our lives. And so I want to point out to you one last interesting thing from this whole talk about faith in this Hebrews chapter 11. So we go through this passage of Hebrews chapter 11. Here's all these great men and women of faith. And the Hebrew writer is obviously writing this so that we learn from it, so that we see their example. 
And we also see along the way, yes, they also are flawed people. Then we get to Hebrews chapter 12. And he says, here is the author and perfecter of your faith. Think about him. Fix your eyes on him. Consider him. But he's not done talking about this subject of faith. If you go on into Hebrews chapter 13, right before he wraps up the letter, he's going to say one last thing about this idea of faith. He will say, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So you see, you still have influence on people. And you know this is true because people have had influence on you. And so we could go through this list in Hebrews chapter 11 and we could think of modern day equivalents for all of us. And so for every Abraham and Sarai, there's a Tom and Paula Lewis. And they're here today, so I kind of get brownie points because they're in the audience. Uh, for every Jacob... There's a Jason Hosh. For every Moses, there's a Paul Jackson. For every David, there's a Jack Cummings. You have those people in your life that made a difference in your life and showed you what it is to be a person who lives by faith. And the Hebrew writer says, remember those people. Because this is a little bit different than Hebrews chapter 11, right? We don't know those people in Hebrews chapter 11. We don't have a personal relationship with anybody in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we know Jesus in chapter 12, but then in chapter 13, he says, there's people in your very own life who you can imitate their faith. And I want you to remember them and do just that. And so we see that a life of faith is best modeled after Jesus, after the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so it is true, yes, we have flaws, we make mistakes, just like the people in Hebrews chapter 11, but imperfect people can put their faith in the perfect Christ. And so I want to encourage you this week to be people who live by faith because the roll call of faith is still being written. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and praise your name and to worship you, to give you thanks for all the things that you have done and continue to do for us. We thank you most of all for the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for the moment that we have had this morning to gather around the table and remember that sacrifice. Father, we are thankful for the example that we have through all those people that we read about in the Old Testament through all the people that we see in the pages of Scripture. Father, we thank you for the encouragement, the support that we draw from those things, from those examples. And yet, Father, we know that the perfect example of faith is your Son, Jesus. Help us this week to focus on Him, to fix our eyes on Him and consider His life. And Father, help us also to be mindful that we, as people living by faith, we have influence on others. And so help us to live faithful lives, not only for our sake, for the sake of your kingdom, but that others might see Jesus in the way that we live and that they too might want to follow you in faith. We thank you, Father, that we can trust you, that we can put our faith in you, that you are a God that we can trust and the God who loves us and takes care of us. We thank you for all the things that you do for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.